Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, the Wickhoff Group, Greenberg Traurig. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, HAP Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, Urban American, and These Friends. Cranes, cranes, more cranes. That's all I see around the city are cranes. And then there are these luxury condominiums, 1,400 feet. Who could be 14? And then there are other ones, 100 feet. We're all over the city. We are having condos. It's condo, it's condomania. So today I've assembled this group of condo developers to talk about their position and what's happening in the condo market in New York City. My guests today include Lori Golub, who is the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel at HFZ Capital. Ken Horn, who is the President of Alchemy Properties. Uh, Michael Stern, who is the Managing uh, Partner at JDS Development. And last but not least, Mr. David Von Spreckelsen, who is the President of Toll Brothers City Living New York City. So you have how many developments under process right now? Well, we have three sites that are in the market, and we have like another four sites that we're designing or starting to build. At, at one time, pricing, you know, a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars, are these over two to three thousand dollars? Yeah, I think most of what you're seeing in the market today, because of you know land cost, is is units that are in the two thousand to three thousand dollar range, and I think that's just sort of standard luxury. And then if you're talking about the higher price points, uh, we have one building on Park Avenue and 89th Street where we're in the four to $5,000 foot range. And I would say that that starts to get to ultra luxury. And you, Lori, what do you have? In um, we've got four, soon to be five more projects in the market right now. And I think they're priced to, depending on the neighborhood and depending on the level of luxury in them. So different neighborhoods command a different level of luxury and uh, different pricing but, but according you know to finish. When you say different neighborhoods, uh, different luxury, and I think a great example is what Ken is doing right now at the Woolworth Building. I mean, the Woolworth Building is this iconic landmark property. Everyone knows about the Woolworth Building. This is Lower Manhattan. And finally, somebody you know, bought the upper floors, which you did, to, to build luxury or ultra-luxury. What are we talking about the, the Woolworth I mean, Building? The Woolworth Building is uh, it's iconic. It's a landmark building. It's not only known in New York, but it's known internationally. So the upper 30 floors have been treated in a way which is befitting the building to a large degree. So we're making large units, but uh, we are renovating them and, and building them in accordance with the decor of the time. So although you've got all the modern amenities, uh, we brought in a designer named Terry Despont, who's you know, internationally known. You sure you don't have an icebox? 
Uh, you know what? <laughs> we, were, we were actually thinking we couldn't decide whether to put electricity in the units, Mike, yeah. to be honest with you, but we decided we'd go with it. But I think that unto itself is, is almost a different animal. Uh, I know Michael's building a beautiful building on 57th Street. A lot of the uh, high rises, the 157s, the 432s, they are modern, beautiful buildings. The Woolworth is not. It's just not a modern building. It's a Gothic tower. So, yes, it's luxurious, less it's beautiful, but it also is. Um, we have 34 jewels. We have only 34 units in the entire building. So, yeah, it's not but, a huge project. But you also had that other property on 15th Street. How many jewels over there? Well, you know, again, as Laurie was saying, uh, you really look at things neighborhood by neighborhood and you look at things building by building. So, that particular building, 35XV, will be finished in February. We only have eight out of 55 units more to sell. Uh, we're averaging probably about 27, 27.50 a foot. Uh, it's certainly luxurious. It's an interesting building architecturally. Uh, we kind of took Michael's lead to a luxury. Michael helped a lot by doing Walker Tower, established the vibrancy and the legitimacy of the high end in that neighborhood. Uh, and we've, we've just carried on. But one can compare the two. The Woolworth building is not 35 XV, and it's not like any other buildings that may be on the High Line or, or on Park but Avenue or elsewhere. What you've done is you, you've gone into Lower Manhattan in an area that hasn't seen prices of this. I mean, everybody knows the Woolworth building, and even when Steve Whitkoff and Ruby and the whole crew had it, they never really imagined that type of renovation. I don't think their plans would have been for 35 units. They would have done it in a perhaps at the days when there were tax abatements, the 425, 421Gs, which would have done situations. So here we have this guy who says, you know, I'm going to go to 17th Street, maybe thought of Barney's Boys Town, and, you know, you go over there, and I still remember I was there before, when you were in contract to be at, right. with Madison, and I, and I look at this and I said, who's going to, I mean, there's great bricks, but the, the, the telephone, the wire, the exchange, and... <clears throat> Walker Tower has done great. I mean, the highest price sold, right? Yeah, it's the highest price per foot downtown. And I think that some buildings, like the Woolworth Building, transcend their neighborhood. So the Woolworth Building is an icon, and it's going to command a major premium. So now you, what do you, you go for family relatives, so you had the Walker, and then there was the Stellar, right? Yeah, well, uh, sort of a sister building, and um, also another example of a building outperforming its neighborhood. We're doing very well there. And, um, you know, those, these great Art Deco icons make the best conversions. The bones are great. They were built before zoning existed, so they have great commanding views that are protected. So they have the best attributes that you'd want to see in a residential. So home. there was once something called Steinway. You know, great pianos, you know, all concert halls. And now over there, part of the 57th Street corridor, which at one time, uh, you know, I'm aging myself, 57th Street had a large number of dentists. A lot of the properties over there... Some of them are like, in our building. Right. And, and a number of them uh, used to be in the, the Williamsburg Savings Bank in downtown Brooklyn. I should point out the top floor of the Woolworth building, the last tenant to leave there, was a dentist. So <laughs> now you're building a very small building, 1,400 feet? About, yeah. And, and you have a... How many square feet uh, is the... The, the first apartment begins like on the 20... 26th floor, the equivalent of the 26th floor. What's really neat about this project is it is an iconic landmark, Steinway Hall, designed by Warren and Wetmore, the same architects who did Grand Central, so it's this iconic landmark, but it's juxtaposed with this very modern tower with very modern proportions. It's very tall, it's very slender, but um, we're sort of integrating the modern and the landmark and, and weaving them together. So how much are units going to sell for in this property, uh, projected, because uh, there's no offering plan, so you know you can't talk about Correct. that. Correct. Um, we think the units will trade in the five to $7,000 range uh, and up in so the project. So here's the question. People watch my show from around the world on the Internet. People say, who are the buyers? Who's buying, you know, uh, in different properties? Who are the buyers on 15th Street? Who are the buyers in the Halcyon on, you know, on 2nd Avenue? Who are the borrowers in the Meatpacking District? Who are the buyers in Walker Tower and Stella Tower? Who bought in the Terrain uh, and, you know, your other properties in one Brooklyn Bridge Park? Who's buying in, in the world today? Michael, who do you see? It runs the gamut, and it's different um, by neighborhood and by building. At Walker, we saw mostly primary residents who were local moving out of other neighborhoods, either uptown to downtown or moving out of 
good downtown neighborhoods into another good downtown neighborhood. Um, at Stella, we've seen more of an investor mix, but, but still pretty diverse. We haven't really seen the crush of foreign buyers that you read about in a lot of our projects. You know, we'll see what happens on 57th Street. We're not on the market yet, but I think it's pretty diverse. David? Yeah, we've focused on traditional residential neighborhoods. So we, we typically are getting New Yorkers, families who are buying in our buildings. And it varies from neighborhood to neighborhood. And we do have our share of investors, but we also have not seen a big uh, amount of foreign buyers. We've always been conservative and not wanted to be in a position where we're relying on a lot of foreign buyers and doing pita tears and whatnot. So we pretty much build for New Yorkers, and that's, that's who generally buys our units. With regard to one of your buildings today, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting concept uh, where you're building uh, the Park Avenue South, where you have residential rental on the lower floors and the condo. Are there two separate entrances and, you know, how, are, how do you project that building? Yeah, so there are two separate entrances, and Equity Residential is doing the lower floors, the first 22 floors, um, as a rental. Uh, their uh, um, tenants will enter on 28th Street. Uh, our condo owners will enter on Park Avenue. We share the amenities in the basement, which is a huge amenity package, probably about 10,000 square feet. And then we have a separate amenity for the condo owners on the 27th floor, which is a sky lounge and indoor outdoor space. I think it's really important about what you're doing on First Avenue with the Sutton. Everybody wanted this 421A tax abatement, this 10-year tax abatement. Talk to me about the Sutton because yeah, it's a unique situation. Right. So uh, on a number of the sites we bought, we looked at doing uh, buildings with and without a tax abatement. And depending on the size and the location, we either went forward or didn't go forward with doing it. And to get it today, if other than doing certificates, you have to do on-site affordable. So the Sutton site was a stalled project by Alexico that we bought. It was originally designed as a rental. It was in a corridor where you had a lot of rentals, but we were going to do condo. So we thought as a hedge uh, that we would have an affordable component on-site and be able to offer the 421A tax abatement. And when you do on-site affordable, it's a very significant abatement. It's 20 years instead of 10 years. As opposed to inside baseball, why don't we explain this to, to my viewers, what this means and who could qualify to get these apartments. How many apartments are, are in the building? So in the building are a little over 100 units. So 20, and, uh, tw approximately 20 units are affordable. A bit over that, yes. And the way it works this is not inclusionary, so we're not getting a floor area bonus. This is just for the tax abatement. So we're allowed to do 20% of the units, not of the square footage, which you typically have to do. And we're allowed to locate them all within a, a block. So all of those units will be on the first uh, six floors, and above that will be the market rate units. And we're also doing the units um, as uh, home ownership, so they're, they're condos and um, we're allowed to go to 125% of AMI. Which is what? So if somebody, AMI is approximately $85,000? No, it's about 60, 65, I think. 65, so somebody can earn up to about $90,000? For a single person, yeah, families, more than that. Family could go up to about $130,000. Yeah, yep. And how much will they pay for that apartment? Uh, because we're talking about two thousand dollars and many other ones. What what's that person? Going yeah, to pay? so they'll buy for you know somewhere around I think two hundred dollars a foot. Something so like somebody that. is going to have the opportunity to buy an aff an affordable co-op with home ownership with a twenty year tax abatement tax abatement or a phase in. Well, it's full abatement for ten years and then it starts to so phase for ten in. years no taxes right. and then a phase in. So someone can buy that if it's a single family person who earns about $85,000, they're gonna be able to buy this for $200,000. Something like that. And somebody who, let's say, is a family of four, which would give them a larger apartment because it's size based on the size over there, they'll be able to maybe pay $400,000. Right. Now, the benefit also to the people within the building is that the, let's say, the other 100 units which are in the building are gonna have a 10-year no taxes for their for their right. units. fully abated for fully 10 years, for ten years and then and trailing off for the next ten. Now, with regard to when people are buying units, and I'd like to pose this to anyone, 
are people still into this psyche of the 421A tax abatement? Well, at 15th Street, we have a tax abatement because we bought certificates. Uh, granted, the tax abatement is not as great as it was, say, it's a seven, phase seven, in also, years. Correct. correct. You know, seven, eight years ago, it was a different type of abatement than it is now. Uh, obviously, at Woolworth, there is no tax abatement. It's it's a rehabilitation. It's uh, it's, it's not ground up. Uh, I think in the luxury market, uh, the market that uh, Michael is referring to, is I'm not sure that it matters. Frankly, I think at these price levels, uh, that no one's coming in and saying, "Gee, you know, um, what is the uh, what's tax abatement?" They look at it as a, a, they're buying a luxury property. They're going to be paying for it. Uh, they want the services. They want the amenities. Um, interestingly, in some circumstances, we're asked, you know, why is the maintenance what the maintenance is? Which I think is, a, you know, a little bit unusual question, of course, because in a smaller building, when you have a doorman, you've got uh, a concierge, and you've got a lounge, and you've got a health club, you've got full-time doorman, obviously, that's going to add up when you've got a very small amount of units. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I, I don't believe that in the luxury, luxury market, that the lack of the abatement is really going to affect the marketplace that much. Lori? I agree. We're seeing the same thing. Um, it, we have a project over on 51st Street, as you know, that's selling um, at, at nice numbers, but under 2,000 a foot. And there, there's an abatement, and people ask the question. But at some of the other projects that are selling um, in multiples, um, it's not even a concern. So, so here's the, the, the question. With, with land, and I, and I think it was our mutual friend David Kramer a couple years ago, 2008, I'm doing a show and we're talking about Brooklyn and people, you know, they're getting offers of $80 a foot for the land. And I mean, we never saw the land prices at this high levels over there. How high can they go? And how hard is it to buy sites and to develop today? Michael? I don't think that there's a lot more room for land to run. Um, I think that I hope not. Uh, we we both hope not. <laughs> I think the land prices have escalated to the point where it's virtually impossible to do a rental in either Brooklyn or Manhattan in a good neighborhood right now. Um, we feel fortunate that we have a decent rental pipeline that's under construction, but we don't know where our next rental project is, and I think that's an issue. Um, but in Manhattan especially, I mean, land costs are higher than your hard costs. It makes no sense. It just doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, long ago, well, Michael, it was the first time in my career where the land cost, uh, at least the offering price, couldn't exceed the hard and soft cost. And you know, it's, it's upside down. Um, but not in Brooklyn yet. Not in Brooklyn yet, but certainly in Manhattan. Uh, but th you know, the, the, the question is, are there going to be people who don't necessarily have our collective wisdom Right, and our collective out you know, really uh, <coughs> uh, so we look at sales analysis on the market that we've been through this through, through, a, through a lot of cycles. Are there people out there who are just going to continue to run it up for the sake that they've never seen a down market? They've only been in the market for the last two or three years, and they just believe that what goes up just continues to go up. But doesn't that also relate, and David's fortunate because he's a public company, so he doesn't have to worry about going to the financial institutions to finance this. They have it on their line of credit. People may be paying outrageous prices, but I don't believe the banks have really gone that crazy to agree to lend that type of money. Are, are we seeing banks going to this ultra high level on lending, or are we talking about alternative lenders, you know, who are insurance companies, or as we would say, finance companies or MES lenders? Michael, Jim. Yeah, I think that you're right. The bank, the conventional banks have been. Um, pretty disciplined on their loan to cost, which is good and healthy for the market. And you've seen, uh, you know, alternative lenders or, frankly, hedge funds and private equity come in and fill that gap, which, you know, could be good for the private equity, but not so good for the developer sponsor. So I think the, the developers and the sponsors have to really be disciplined and, and not get caught up in, in breathing the fumes of the market. Are, are we seeing, you know, relating to what Ken may have just alluded, are we seeing foreign investors or foreign, not local people, come into the market, buy the, pay a certain price, and think that they can build it. <clears throat> I think a good example is the nonprofit that was sold on 22nd Street, which was acquired by a Chinese company who's planning to convert that property into a luxury condominium. Maybe they, they have their own Chinese sources that they don't really need the conventional banks to do it, but it's a different world. 
the answer is yes. There's Chinese equity in several high-profile deals that have happened recently. You just mentioned one, you know, an RFR's deal on Lexington. There's a Chinese equity partner there. Atlantic Yards, there's Chinese equity in that deal. Um, there's the Park Lane deal has Chinese equity, not Chinese, Malaysian equity. Malaysian equity, equity. right. Um, so I think the answer is clearly yes. There's, there's definitely sovereign wealth funds and foreign capital flooding in right now. Are we seeing luxury condos being built <clears throat> outside of Manhattan? Or have you thought of it, I mean, uh, in, in different markets? I mean, I don't want to go to Florida. I, I'm talking about in the metro region well, over here. We're in Florida now. We're doing two condominiums <clears throat> in Brooklyn, one in Park Slope and one in downtown Brooklyn that we're going to be on the market first quarter of next year with both. And we've, right. we just finished one in... Uh, um, in uh, Carol Gardens, you know, David's doing one. And uh, sure, and there's, as we were discussing, the Brooklyn market is not a secondary market now. It's a primary market. Uh, people are living and moving to Brooklyn because they want to be in Brooklyn, not because they're priced out of Manhattan. And there aren't that many good sites to develop. It's hard to find good sites, and it's just really a question of supply and demand. I mean, the project we just finished on um, court between Sackett and Union, I mean, we took it over. It was a defaulted site, similar to David taking over a site over on First Avenue. It was a hole in the ground for two years, and we inherited plans, which were large units. Two bedrooms that were 1,300 feet, three bedrooms which were 1,900 feet, uh, and four bedrooms that were probably closer to 2,500 feet. And we had some trepidation, because we said, gee, is the market going to be, uh, be able to absorb it? And absorb it they did, and if we had probably three times as many, they would have sold. When Robert, you know, took over the uh, Watchtower properties, you yeah. know. Robert Levine. The Robert Levine. Um, it really, you know, it also opened up at the wrong time in the recession and everything else, so it was hit with a, a variety of difficulties. But you're building this luxury project on uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park with the hotel component. Yeah, we, well, so we, we've been in Brooklyn for a while. We did uh, a number of buildings in Williamsburg about seven years ago. Um, the and later Dumbo, ones, you also and Dumbo, and the later ones in Williamsburg got caught a little bit in the downturn, but we, we thought that pricing back then was going for the best product was going to get to about a thousand a foot and then uh... market changed we came into dumbo um, i think two thousand and ten we bought a site at a good number it was about a hundred dollars a foot um, and we ended up averaging about nine hundred a foot um, and then we started looking at other opportunities and the rfp came out for the the, the project in, in brooklyn bridge park and there we knew, we were talking about the tax abatement before, there we knew there would be no tax abatement because uh, the taxes were going to the maintenance for the park. Uh, there would be a, a land lease, uh, which, you know, because it's, it's on a ground lease. And so you would have carry costs that weren't, uh, weren't low. Uh, so we were conservative in estimating where we would be pricing wise. And our initial pro forma was about a little over 900 a foot. And the market kept getting better and better, and we, we designed big units, which luckily the market started moving towards bigger units. And we came out around uh, 1,300 a foot, and we've raised prices numerous times, and we're now averaging around 1,800 a foot. And we, I never thought I would see that. I've lived in and around that area for nearly 30 years now, and I, I'm just astounded by it. You know, when we talk neighborhoods, and, and I, you know, we were talking prior to the show about the, the resurgence in the growth of Harlem. Now, uh, the, right now you have uh, Eichner uh, planning a residential rental, and you also have uh, Blumenfeld on a rental. There were certain condominiums that were built in Harlem, uh, Fifth on the Park, which also opened up at the wrong time in some other markets. Do we see luxury going into other sections? And, and I always bring up transportation is, is keen. To everything, everybody, you know, if you why Williamsburg, transportation, uh, ferries, other things, Long Island City, transportation over here. Now, one area which I joke about, but I'm not really joking about it because <coughs> Josh Muss built the Oceana, and the Oceana is a luxury condominium in Brighton Beach. Uh, a large number of it is owned by Russian people, you know, who are residents of America, not uh, the Kazatans over there. <coughs> one of the nicest areas which is still available on the water is Coney Island. You know, you grew up in Brooklyn originally, and, and you know, Coney Island, there's a transportation, there's a train, and just like Brighton Beach, but Brighton Beach, when you get off, you're at the train stop. Do, do we see or do we look at, because there's limited amount of land that we can build, do we see other condos perhaps 
in, you know, I noticed in, in, I think it was the Wall Street Journal this weekend, that they spoke about a new condo that was built in Coney Island. Do we see that as a possibility? No, it's possible, but I think we all agree that just because you say something is luxury doesn't make it luxury. It's, it's neighborhood by neighborhood. I mean, I, I think, yes, it's alluring to be on the beach, but it's Coney Island. It's a different demographic. It's a different buyer profile. I'm not sure you're Let, going let's to get... Remember the, let's remember before the Highland was completed. Let's remember when, certain, when Jeff Levine built a rental called the Ohm. And the banks really said, what are we doing over here? How are we going to make the number? You're but building on the High Line in the meatpacking district. I remember years ago going to the meatpacking district at 4 o'clock because I was doing work for Bankers Trust, and that's when you met with the, the people in the meatpacking district. Those are all examples where there was a transformative catalyst that made something happen. And, you know, the Bloomberg administration made the High Line happen, and you saw the ripple effects of that, you know. There isn't enough critical mass of change yet in Coney Island to make that viable. And they're also in Manhattan. I mean, Coney, Coney Island, if you work in Midtown and you live in Coney Island, so it could take you an hour to get to work. But in, in the same manner that we were talking before about the Chinese and other investors over here, I mean, if you go to Flushing, <coughs> you are in little China. Uh, you know, there are 180 different dialects and everything over there. And Chinese have this major approach, especially the Asians, want to own. Even the retail stores in Flushing are owned. They don't, they don't lease them because there's this ownership mentality over there. Could we see perhaps in certain sections of Queens some luxury being built? Michael? Yeah, I think you, you really are seeing it built. There are a number of luxury condominiums that are being done by smaller uh, developers, regional developers out there. Um, I don't think it's a market I understand very well, so I'm yeah, not I, dipping my toe there. I think what's interesting, because the three of us have all done work in Brooklyn, is younger people and younger families move to Brooklyn because of what Brooklyn's become. You've got Smith Street, you've got Coy Street, you've got Atlantic Avenue. It's hip. It's interesting, right? So, I mean, years ago, when I got out of college and I got out of law school, young people moved to Forest Hills, right? That's what they rented. If you couldn't rent in Manhattan, Forest Hills was the place. I can't think of any of my children's friends, all of them were in their 20s, who would ever consider moving to Forest Hills. It doesn't happen. You know, there are young people in my office who are renting in Bedford-Stuyvesant, right? It's just great. It's a developing area. It's a one, you know, it's a 20 minute commute to the city, 25 minute commute. But in order, and even Riverdale, I mean, look at the rental car in Riverdale. If you look at Riverdale Avenue, there are a couple of nice bakeries and pizza places, but there aren't nice bars well, and restaurants, I, I so it's a little the, bit different. The, the example in Riverdale was the Solari, it was a beautiful yep. building. It was not too far from the trains. It's seven years later, and they still haven't sold all the units. And I, I think it's location, it's transportation, it's what amenities are needed and everything else uh, in the market. One last question, because we don't have much time. What about Staten Island? Anybody thoughts on anything in Staten Island? We, we've looked at Staten Island, but, you know, like Riverdale, there are certain communities where it seems people want to live in a much more low density environment than, uh, and, you, and you don't see many multifamily buildings being done successfully for I home mean, ownership. You have right now one Ironstone is building, you know, it's on the, over there. And I hear it's going fairly well. So, I mean, we it's definitely- a, It's a rental. Well, there, there's a condo too, uh, right by the ferry. Uh, you're talking about Staten Island? Yes. Yeah, there is a condo. Um, I have a friend who bought a unit there and, um, I think it's going reasonably well, but still there's, there's a cap. Unlike, you know, the way things have gone in Brooklyn where you can really get a great multiple on some of these sites, that, that uh, the better sites, and really getting great numbers. But in Staten Island, I don't think people are, are buying for more than a couple hundred. So in conclusion, we're going to continue to see luxury condos being built. There's a market by domestic people, the people who live here, and also by international investors. And I hope that all four developers continue to do well. I thank the thank Lori, Ken, Michael, and David, and I'll see you next week.